Welcome. Thank you for attending our ongoing series of uh, webinars on various topics. Uh, the topic for today is uh, enterprise architecture and big data. And of course, uh, everyone knows about the uh, big data world. It's a up and coming activity. And what we're doing today is gonna be talking about how enterprise architecture and big data work together. Uh, we're also going to talk about, uh, frankly, some of the issues that are already being seen uh, with big data and where enterprise architecture, I believe, will uh, help uh, quite a bit uh, in this particular area. Uh, we're hearing, obviously, lots of great things about the big data, uh, but there's some case studies out there right now already uh, that are showing us that without uh, something prior to big data, we may have some issues uh, that's there, and hopefully uh, enterprise architecture can give us some insights uh, into that. Uh, from from uh, that perspective. Uh, the uh, webinar today will run an hour, uh, hopefully plus or minus just a few minutes, uh, uh, trying to make this as, a, as a com uh, compact for all of you and, and on time as we can. And uh, we're gonna get started uh, right now. So uh, thank you again for your attendance and let's get started here. And uh, hopefully I can add a little bit of humor starting with this particular slide here. The first thing we're gonna be talking about is enterprise architecture. That's my attempt at humor. I'm not sure if that's successful at this point or not, but uh, the concepts of enterprise architecture really are very important uh, prior to uh, looking at uh, big data. And uh, this is a real enterprise. And uh, please notice the graphical representation of uh, this particular enterprise, and that's what we stress in our workshops and our consulting work, that enterprise architecture is about what we refer to as human communication. Uh, not compiler communication at first, which we're going to do eventually, of course, but human communication, and providing essentially an in-context understanding of that. Uh, and uh, we'd like to also talk to you about a little bit of history about enterprise architecture. Uh, one of the great things about the internet and Wikipedia and LinkedIn and all those other sources out there is that anybody can write anything about anything. Of course, that's the problem with those sources is that anybody can write anything about anything. And as far as enterprise architecture is concerned, it has been around for a very long time. And this is one of the things I just wanna mention here uh, as we get started, uh, the person that we would suggest, and a lot of people suggest, really began this area of architecture of something we've not referred to as enterprises, but initially uh, we were referring to architecting systems, is a gentleman named P. Dwayne Dewey Walker. And I'm not sure if, how many of you know who he is. Uh, as it says here, he began his uh, uh, venture in architecture in 1966 at IBM. And a few famous people uh, were working uh, for uh, Dewey Walker back then. Uh, one notably, uh, of course, I think most of you know, is John Zachman. And John actually worked uh, with uh, Dewey Walker at IBM. Uh, you know, and I, I know that John is a very famous person and a, and a colleague of uh, mine. And uh, John and I started Ziffa many years ago, and uh, he's still lecturing on, on his framework. And we're working, of course, uh, doing enterprise architecture. Uh, from that perspective. But the real grandfather of this area is a gentleman named Dewey Walker. And the reason this is important for you and I is because if we don't look at history, what, would, what tends to happen, we make the same mistakes over and over again. And I would say that we are into really enterprise architecture 2.0 or 3.0 at this point because it really began in those days. And as you notice here from the slide, uh, Dewey was named the manager of information systems planning at IBM. And a, real, a year later, he became the manager of information systems architecture. Fascinating name change, something to contemplate here. But they realized that IBM in 1967 is first you have to have architecture before you can plan things. Kind of an interesting statement, that was not subtle. There's a lot of planning going on in organizations without architecture. Here at IBM early on, they recognized that planning came first. In this capacity, he oversaw many of the developments of important systems analysis tools and helped share uh, many new uh, programs with Fortune 500 companies uh, that IBM was servicing. In 1970, uh, Dewey was commissioned to establish, get this, a national marketing approach for IBM. What does that have to do with architecture? Well, basically, what IBM understood, if they had the client's blueprint or helped the client build the blueprint 
of where they're going to be and where they are, the desired state and the as is state, they could sell into that. Uh, using the physical analogy, uh, you need uh, 24 two by fours, a couple of gallons of paint, and a, and, and a hammer and a nail and a chisel or something like that. So they understood the importance of architecture uh, from a marketing perspective, and then this became an actual service uh, for IBM. That assignment resulted in a highly successful program called Business Systems Planning. This is really the root. Fascinating. Business Systems Planning. We all have seen how, IB, uh, how uh, enterprise architecture uh, for some uh, are looking at it from a systems implementation standpoint. Uh, we tend to call that type of architecture EITA, which is really what we see a lot of organizations doing, enterprise information technology architecture, and really not enterprise architecture. It starts with a business first. And uh, Dewey got a, a very uh, uh, great award at that particular time. And I'm going to bring up to the camera here the actual text. <laughs> I don't know if, yes, you can sort of see that. I'm going to run it by. I got this out of the Smithsonian. I'm just kidding. The reason I show this to people is that this is really where this started. It did not start in the late 80s, early 90s. It started in the late 60s. And, of course, we've had the privilege since 1972 of enhancing uh, these types of things that we now call enterprise architecture that's there. So this was really the planning guide that IBM put out uh, quite a while ago. What is enterprise architecture? Once again, as just a, a, a frame of reference here uh, as we move forward, uh, we define enterprise architecture as explicitly representing an organization's desired state and as-is state. There's actually two things that we have to, to build, and then we can, can of course, put a road back to, uh, roadmap together through a set of independent, non-redundant artifacts, quite simply saying, what is the minimum set of things that we need for people to understand? Those are what we refer to as the architectural representations, and that is equivalent in the physical world to what we refer to as engineering. Defining how these artifacts relate with each other, that's the second set of models that we refer to. We refer to those as solution models or implementation models. And in the physical world, those are manufacturing. And in the physical world, we know there's two sets of representations, engineering representations and manufacturing representations. We're going to suggest very strongly that enterprise architecture requires two sets of representations, the architectural representations and the implementation representations. Once again, from a standpoint of learning, most of the people that talk about enterprise architecture do not recognize that yet. It's kind of sad that this has been around for four decades, and we still see that lack of understanding of the two basic fundamental uh, models that are required. A lot of enterprise architecture definitions start there. You can see that we're about halfway through. There, we now have a bunch of models, which are fantastic. Models are great. But as you can see here, the real objective is developing a set of prioritized, aligned initiatives. Some people now call them capabilities. We actually develop capabilities. We don't declare capabilities. We find out from these representations what are the capabilities the organization needs in the future to move forward to meet the organizational goals. And then we come up to the second from last comma, communicating this understanding to stakeholders. And there are multiple stakeholders. Uh, there are five that we have identified as unique uh, stakeholders, unique classes of stakeholders that require different presentations of this material. There isn't one diagram that will address everyone that's there. And of course, if you, if you, any of you have had the privilege or pleasure or frustration in building a house, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have the plumber's view, you have the electrical view, you have the heating, ventilation, air conditioning view. Different stakeholders, different representations, and then once again, we'd all mush those together. And of course, the phrase mush is a technical term <laughs> that's there. Uh, advancing the organization from its as-is state and its desired state. So this is our definition of enterprise architecture, representing an organization's desired state and as a state through a series of independent, non-redundant artifacts. We refer to those as the architectural representations, um, defining how these artifacts relate to each other. We call those implementation representations. So, for example, an implementation representation would be business process modeling notation, object models, uh, data flow diagrams, use cases, 
those types of things were referred to as the implementation models that should be derived from the architectural representations that are there. Then developing a set of prioritized aligned initiatives or capabilities, if you're comfortable with that term, needed to, to meet the organization's goals. And once again, the most important thing is the communications aspect. And what we found in our Twitter, Facebook society that we're in right now is that these representations need to be just explained to the stakeholders, and this is not a joke, in less than 90 seconds. That is an objective that we think is extremely important. We're not teaching them our language. We're putting what we do in their language so they can understand it very quickly. And all the representations that we do for enterprise architecture have that requirement. The definition of enterprise is essentially a collection of roles and responsibilities that are there. Uh, sometimes that word seems to get in the way. You do not have to do architecture of your whole enterprise, comma, not period. What happens if you don't? Now we have the concepts of integration and interfacing. Anything that you've essentially architected, integration will be a high probability. Anything outside of that boundary is going to be interfaced. Not one bad and one, one good. They're very, very different. However, you really can't post-integrate. So it's very important to get that definition. So we can have a whole corporation, a division. You can make your, your choices that are there. They are very, very, very important. Now, the term architecture has been around for quite some time. It's the art and science of building something and the manner in which components and artifacts are, rec are, are organized. The science we can teach equals MC squared, F equals MAI equals D over T. The problem is the art. It's not really a problem. We get that through practicing, and that's really uh, the very, very important. I don't think you're going to get that, once again, a little smile on my face, through passing a multiple guess exam. It really is essentially practicing, and that's one of the hallmarks of the approaches that we have. So what can we learn about all of this uh, as we move forward? This is the baseline for everything that follows here. What can we learn about this? I call this section my Homer Simpson section, almost like, duh, of course it, it, it is there. But um, with due respect to Homer Simpson, sometimes he was a very, had some very clever phrases. <laughs> so when you write things down, when, you, when things get complex, more than a few people, you've got to write things down. Duh, of course we have to write things down. If, you have, if you're building a log cabin, you may not have to write things down. You need to write things down when you're building or changing a 100-story building. And oh, by the way, if you stack 100 log cabins up uh, on top of each other, you're not going to get a 100-story building. Uh, try it someday. You'll find out what's going on. This concept of iterate, iterating is fantastic, but we have to know the end state. The other thing is we're not going to learn about much about the 100-story building when we have a log cabin and we try to essentially evolve to that. It is different. It is fundamentally different. It's a different set of activities. If you're building a balsa model with an airplane, you may not have to write things down. You've got to write things down if you're building or changing a Boeing 747, especially if I'm in it flying over water at night. I want to make sure that that particular activity has been architected at excruciating levels of detail. But what you write down, but what you write down, how you write it down, and how you build it affects the ability to change something. Yes. It affects the ability to change something. Change comes from two things, architecture and the concept of assemble to order that we'll get to in just a moment. We have to recognize that this is the baseline for managing change. And it is awful hard to see change or strategy in 700 pages of text or 70 pages of text as human beings. Once again, remember the human consumable aspect of this. Architecture is really about addressing complexity and change. And big data is looking at large amounts of things that people want to change. It's a natural progression into that particular activity. The concepts of flexibility or agility historically come from two things. As I just mentioned a moment ago, architecture and assemble to order manufacturing or implementation processes. There's two things that are going on there. One of the analogies that people have said is quite powerful, and I'm just mentioning this to you briefly, is the analogy of a salad bar. If you can imagine just a moment a salad bar, 
which has individual elements in it that have been architected. You've got the romaine lettuce, you've got the um, uh, iceberg lettuce, you have the garbanzo beans and the tomatoes and the ricotta cheese and or whatever you put in the salads and carrots and everything else, individual components. And you walk up to the salad bar and you assemble to order. Now, if you've got 16 bins there, imagine how many salads that you can produce. It takes a little bit of time. The alternative is provide from stock. You have it right there. You go next door, you have a prepackaged salad that's hermetically sealed, and then you go back to your office and you try to take it apart because you decide you don't like green peppers and you don't like this or like that. <laughs> that's the alternative. One is extremely quick and one is pretty quick once we have the architectural elements. Now you're seeing the difference between the concepts of architecture and implementation. Architecture is the 16 elements on the salad bar. The implementation is you grab those things out of that. Two different sets of models, architecture models, implementation models. It's difficult to believe that agility comes from handcrafting things smaller and faster. We just cannot keep up. Agile enterprises are the ability to address complexity and change. Graphical representations are the key to addressing complexity and change. And there's fundamentally two types of representations, those architectural representations and those implementational representations, recognizing the audiences. The subject matter experts are different. That's there. Just continuing in just a moment here, this concept of speeding up change. We need to look outside of IT for just a little while for enterprise architecture and big data and see what other um, professions have done. There's a tremendous amount of literature out there outside of the IT literature that is quite powerful. And one of the things out there is this concept of the general manufacturing maturity model that provides us with an understanding of the baseline on how organizations change in the physical world. And our approach essentially is to look at that and see what we can borrow from those disciplines that have been out there for centuries, if not longer, that's there. Not everything is translatable. One of the things that we always hear, well, yeah, but a 100-story building doesn't change very much, and our enterprise systems change all the time. There's a perhaps here. Perhaps it's the way we build our enterprise systems and the lack of architecture that is causing that issue, rather than saying IT, change, IT systems change very fast and buildings don't. So let's look at it a little bit differently. Perhaps it's the lack of architecture and the way we build systems that are causing this. So let's go on for just quickly here. The general manufacturing maturity phases. The first phase is what's referred to as make to order. And most of our organizations that we have the privilege of working with, frankly, are in this area. If you hear the concepts of requirements definition, the concepts of, of, the, of, of specifications, screen design, report layouts, that is what we refer to as make to order. Essentially, the organization is waiting there for something to come in the door. We refer to that as make to order. Long lead times, high costs, generally low reliability. The second phase of maturing is what we refer to as provide from stock. And in the IT world, that is commercial off-the-shelf packages, COTS packages. So we can see where most organizations are. One of the things that's very important about commercial off-the-shelf packages, COTS packages, is that if we start adding functionality, whether it's through APIs or whatever it is, we have to recognize with eyes wide open what's happening. We're actually going back to an earlier state of maturity. You are increasing the complexity of the organization. Now you have the package software, you have the custom modules, and you have the interfaces. I'm not saying don't do it, but make sure that you understand that when you are modifying these packages that are pride from stock, you have increased the complexity of the organization, and that's something we need to make sure of uh, comes through loud and clear. We do get reduced cost. We do get high reliability. The issue is limited flexibility. And the most powerful of the maturing uh, uh, levels is what we're called to as assemble to order. This is what we, we believe the enterprise needs to strive for if it's not there already. And most enterprises around the world 
are not there yet. It's just a matter of time as we see in the physical world. Excuse me. This concept of assemble to order provides us with almost custom products, high reuse, reduced time to market, and mass customization in quantities of one. This concept, ladies and gentlemen, is all around us in our daily lives. I talked to you about the salad bar. Walk into a big box store like Home Depot or Lowe's or Best Buy. They have figured out what essentially the store layout is to provide you with the greatest flexibility. Let's talk about walking into a store that provides you with the basic uh, foundations for building a home. There's the lumber department, there's the windows, there's the door section, there's the roofing section, there's the nails, the hammers, the chisels, uh, the paint. Those are the elements, the architectural elements, and you put them together to build an implementation composite that's there, assemble to order, all around us. A menu that you go to a restaurant, assemble to order. You can see how powerful this concept is, and it's something our approach to enterprise architecture is fundamentally trying to educate people with, and, and that's how we practice. It is so basic to speeding up change that it is, it is going to essentially provide us with that baseline that we need. We're extremely excited about this because people are starting to pay attention uh, in this particular area. What a powerful concept. And all we had to do, essentially, is to look outside of IT for just a little bit of time and build that analogy. And our thanks to, essentially, the, the pioneers in the area, specifically, especially Dewey Walker, that actually provided that baseline uh, for us many years ago that's there. The concept of a framework is something I just want to go over very quickly. It is, a unfortunately, a woefully misunderstood activity uh, in enterprise architecture. A framework is inert. It doesn't do anything. It is a thinking tool. It's a very important thinking tool, so that's what it does, but it, it is not prescriptive. That is a methodology. And in our business of enterprise architecture, we don't yet have an understanding of what a framework is, let alone essentially which framework we're going to pick. And I'm not going to get into that today because we know that's a nightmarish topic. I wish I could, but this is about big data. This is to us an example of a framework. The reason I mention this one here is uh, this is Mendeleev's periodic table of the, element, of the elements, and it didn't matter what you called yourself prior to Mendeleev figuring this out. You could call yourself a chemist, but you are an alchemist. The framework provides us with the baseline for the profession, but we have to have an honest, good framework. We can't just have roll your own frameworks that are out there or something like that. And this is the architectural framework for chemistry. And with methodology, we produce implementations, which are compounds. The architectural elements are on the left. The implementation compounds are on the right. The way we get from architecture to implementation is through the concept of a methodology. Here's the framework for music. Every profession seems to have a framework. There's a hint here. Once we have a framework, we can get a profession. We're getting there in e enterprise architecture, we're not there yet, because we're still arguing about what a framework is, let alone picking the one that's there. This is a fascinating set of understandings we get from music that's there. And of course, what we have uh, using methodology is a series of implementation or compounds that are there. Very, very powerful concept uh, that we see here. The last one I want to do is this one here. I'm trying to use this one with you right now, the 26 letters of the alphabet. Maybe I'm doing a good job, don't know. This is what I'm trying to use right now as the frame of reference for communications with you. And of course, there's an extreme number of compounds uh, that we can produce once we have that understanding of what those elements are. But the elements, do not tell us the architectural elements, which is the alphabet, do not tell us about I before E except after C or how to build a sentence or what the definitions are of the words. That is architecture on the left. It is implementation on the right. And this is one of the concepts that is yet to be understood well with enterprise architecture. Most organizations, once again, are building implementation composites. And that's why we're having troubles out there in architecture, because we're actually not doing architecture, we're doing implementation modeling, which is good, fantastic, 
but it's not architecture. It's something a little bit different. So we're going to suggest essentially that a good framework has a good definition of artifacts. It has six, uh, excuse me, five elements, what, how, where, who, when, and why. And if there is a, another interrogative, then somebody's get a Nobel Prize. And on the right-hand side, I give you the translation of what essentially those what, how, where, who, when, and why elements are. These are what we refer to as the architectural artifact understandings. The second definition that we need is essentially the stakeholders and transformations. And basically, there are people that need to describe the business. There are people that need to define the relationships. There are people that need to specify the components and the services. There are people that need to identify the technologies. And finally, the people that need to select the solutions. And this is not a decomposition. These are transformations. It's a very different concept. And essentially, this is the enterprise framework that we present to you and to our client base and to people that are educated in our process. And it is essentially an elaboration of the fine work of John Zachman. So this is essentially the baseline of what we talk about before we get into big data. And what we're going to be talking about, of course, in big data is talking about this particular column, what we refer to as the materials column. And as you can see here in row three is when we introduce the concept of data. So what I've done for you very briefly here is just to give you an uh, a overview of the concepts of enterprise architecture as we essentially move into these concepts of big data. And refer to all of this as holistic enterprise architecture. And it requires a frame of reference. Every science that we've seen out there prior to it becoming a profession needs a frame of reference, a framework. It requires two representations. One is what we refer to of, of as architecture models. In the physical world, we refer to those as engineering models. It requires implementation models, architecture, implementation, implementation, manufacturing. Engineering models, manufacturing models in the physical world. In the enterprise architecture world, we refer to these as architectural representations and implementation representations. It requires a methodology that is represented by a true framework. Methodologies work with a framework. There's no such thing that we can tell of a method that's neutral to a framework. We haven't found one in the physical world. And if someone comes up with one in the enterprise architecture world, then once again, Nobel Prize time here. We just look at things very practically. We use the HUM test a lot. We use the HUM test. What is the HUM test? If it doesn't make sense in the physical world, it's probably not going to make much sense in the enterprise world either. And that home test is one of the most valuable tests that we see here, especially, unfortunately, nowadays with all the things that are out on the Internet. It enumerates all the architectural models. It essentially enumerates all the implementation models. There is a set, a finite set, a finite set of architectural representations and implementation representations. And it guides the practitioner in the development of architecture models and implementation models. That's what a methodology does. And it results in initiative to move the organization to its desired state. It does not stop at the modeling activities that are there. Now, in summary, before we get into essentially now this concept of big data, <clears throat> here is what we believe is the state of the practice of enterprise architecture. This may be a little bit uncomfortable to people, but we sort of need to know where we're at here because I think that we need to position the science of big data, not sure the word science is correct, big data analysis in the context of where it's coming from. We're going to suggest to you, number one, an agreed to definition of enterprise architecture is lacking. There's a lot of them out there. But we're not going to get anywhere until we essentially understand what this is. Number two, an agreed to definition of a framework is lacking. I didn't say, which is number three, to pick a framework, but actually what a framework is. A framework is not a methodology. And the framework is a, essentially the fundamentals for 
a profession. We have to have a framework. There's one in medicine. There's one in accounting. Every discipline has one. Engine, electrical engineering, civil engineering, manufacturing, you know, uh, operational engineering, all these disciplines have a framework. And then, essentially, the profession begins. So number three, an agreed-to framework, once a definition of framework is established, is lacking. We, if I can humbly suggest, have gone past this. We believe that that should is settled as far as we're concerned. And the reason we say that is that we can take what other people suggest are frameworks and map it into what we use and we can do that every time. The converse isn't correct. They can't take the framework that we use and map it into their world. Something is lacking. And again, I would use the home test at that particular point. The state of the practice, number four. Most modelings, comments what we refer to as EITA, Enterprise Information Technology Architecture, is around systems and implementations. That's what we suggest is going on today in the work that we see out there. And people call it by various things, application architecture, information or data architecture. We suggest, by the way, information is different than data, a topic for another day, technology architecture, and we sometimes refer to this lovingly as the bait model. Business architecture, applications architecture, information architecture, technology architecture, we suggest are what we refer to as EITA and not EA, because we are putting composite models together. I want to stress again, we're not saying it's wrong. We're saying it's different. And it actually should be the second step in our architectural activities and not the first. Number five, we now see business architecture popping its head as being the next evolution. Well, um, if you use the proper framework, you can position business architecture within the enterprise framework that we showed you. So it's not something new, it's something that people are looking at because they don't have a proper frame of reference that's there. In the enterprise architecture framework that we showed you, the work of John Zachman, you know, is the beginning of that. And the framework that he has uh, is, if I can use the phrase, one and the same in, in what we have. What we've done is put a little bit of elaboration on there for practicing. Business architecture sits right there. It always has, as many other disciplines. So once somebody tells us what they're developing, not through a hocus pocus or words, but says these are the artifacts that we're developing, we can map it in and we put a label on it, and sometimes we put a label on it as business architecture. So a proper framework will enumerate the various architectures in an enterprise, of which business architecture is one. Number six, and this is what leads us to essentially where we are right now, the modeling of data seems to be the most advanced from both theory and practice. And we think that's why this concept of big data is getting some attention right now for a number of reasons. One is there's a lot of data out there. <laughs> I think all of you uh, would suggest the same thing. There's a tremendous amount of it out there. Um, and people want to do something with it. We do have to suggest that most of the data out there, though, has not been architected. And that should give us just a little bit of pause here uh, for a moment. Um, it's kind of scary in some areas. So that's where we think we are, which leads us to the practice that a lot of people are calling right now big data, you know, that's there. And as we transition into this concept of big data, I'm just throwing up here essentially a life cycle, plan, analyze, design, construct, a methodology. This isn't, of course, exact to what you possibly are using, but most of our organizations go through some life cycle to build systems, plan, analyze, design, construct, or something like that. You may have a few more phases or you obviously have a lot more detail, but basically there's some concepts essentially from conceptualization of what you want to do with your business people or your subject matter experts all the way through some uh, some development of some solution <clears throat> that it usually leads to some mechanization. And there's a series of representations, graphical representations in most cases, hopefully, that people have put together. And I'm not suggesting this, this is the correct ones. Uh, again, I'm trying to give you a context of, of what is there. 
The thing we have to recognize about big data is that not all data has gone through this life cycle. And I'm chuckling because that's what we're seeing is one of the issues. What is it that you're looking at when you see data out there? And how do you actually get the intent from the business from where we're at? So what we've seen is some interesting things out there. Uh, this is a very current, as you can see here, a little uh, uh, article that Tom Davenport wrote uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, and I just picked out, uh, uh, again, some big data information out of this thing. And this is, again, for you and I, the home test. As it says here, first thing is about American Airlines. And by the way, this was his work that he did 10 years ago at American Airlines. As it says here, at American Airlines, more than a decade ago, they told me during a research visit they had 11 different usages of the term airport. Now, I'm a frequent flyer. This scared me <laughs> tremendously, okay? As he said here, as a frequent traveler on their planes, I was initially a bit concerned about this, but when they explained it, uh, explained it the proliferation of meetings made sense. They said in the cargo, uh, the cargo people at American Airlines view any place you can pick up or drop off cargo as an airport. The maintenance people viewed any place that you can fix an airplane as an airport. The people who worked with the International Air Transportation Authority lied on the list of international airports and so on. This scared me. It made Tom comfortable, but it scared me. If we try to take these disparate databases that have different net definitions of the word airport, what are we going to get? Well, I want to make sure that the pilot flying the airplane knows which word is being used in what context. And if we mush it all together, how are we going to do that? How are we going to get the semantics? Now, please remember that Tom's article is a recognition that essentially the meanings made sense. How do you have the unique meanings when you essentially have a running database? Food for thought. The next week, I was doing some consulting work, he says, at Union Pacific Railroad. They sheepishly admitted at some point, I'm sure he had to coax this out of them, that they had great debates on what constitutes a train. For some, it's an abstract scheduling entity. Others, it's a locomotive. Yet for others, it's a locomotive and whatever rail cars it is pulling at the time. Frankly, not as big a concern as the airports, but the same thing. The question is, when you use data out of context, because you don't have the traceable concept, context. Once again, the traceable context, as we'll be talking about a little bit, you gotta be a little bit careful. And I believe that enterprise architecture is going to address this as we'll see in just a few minutes. Financial Times, earlier in the year. Big data, are we making a big mistake? By the way, this presentation is not about killing big data. It's about opening everybody's eyes and saying, what do we have out here and how do we make this work? How do we make this work? But the question is, how do you take existing databases and use it? Not how do you do it tomorrow? And that's what people have been trying to do. So Tim Hartford wrote an article in the Financial Times. Incidentally, I'm finding a tremendous amount of understanding about enterprise activities in technology, as you're seeing here, not from the IT literature as much, but from other areas. And so more and more reading outside of IT is becoming important because that's when we start seeing the effects of enterprise architecture, excuse me, effects of enterprise information technology that's there. So Tim says, cheerleaders for big data have made four exciting claims each one reflecting in the success of Google flu trends. If you remember a while back, Google had put together, using all of the data they have on you and I, trying to figure out what the essentially flu trend was going to be uh, in various areas in the United States. 
Um, if from a standpoint of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, unfortunately, these predictions cost them billions, billions of dollars in inaccurate activities that are there. And there's a number of different reasons uh, that this occurred. The data analysis produced uncanny, uh, uh, essentially for four exciting claims, each one reflecting in the success of Google Trends. And these were the claims that data analysis produces uncannily accurate, uncanny, uncannily accurate results, excuse me, that every single data point can be captured, making old statistical sampling techniques obsolete. That was the failure, by the way, the major failure in the Google flu trends. They didn't capture everything because the number of people that actually have internet access is an issue. <laughs> the number of people that are using Google that are not all the people on the internet is also an issue. So you don't have 100% sampling size. It wasn't even close. That is passe to fret about what causes what because statistical correlation tells us what we need to know. That's another claim that has been proven to be incorrect. And that scientific or statistical models aren't needed because to quote the end of theory, provocative essay published in Wired in 2008, with enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. All of these have been shown in this article to be a problem. Let me go further. They were actually false. And we're relying on uh, science but the question is, what's the underlying data? We're forgetting about essentially understanding the principles of design of experiments and all these scientific principles that have been around for, for some time in the quest, in the desire to essentially use this in a different way. It's very, very, very important that we understand where we are because then we can address it. And I believe enterprise architecture, again, is gonna get us there. Unfortunately, these four articles of faith are at best optimistic over simplifications. At worst, according to the person that studied this at Cambridge University, they can be complete bullocks, absolute nonsense. There's another word that we can use for bullocks, but we can't do that in mixed company that's there. Caution, 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 caution is what really we need to do. If we look at uh, this page here, we have essentially four different phrases, and the reason I need to talk to you about this for just a moment is to get a little bit of understanding of what we're trying to do. There is forward engineering, which essentially is plan, analyze, design, construct. That is the precursor of figure 3B, which is reverse engineering, which is trying to take running data structures and figure out what the business intent was. That's what we're trying to do with big data. But all we have here is running code in general. Now we're gonna talk about how we can do this if we have these intermediate steps. If you have something forward engineered, then there's a strong possibility that you can reverse engineer it. Another phrase that's out there is restructuring. And restructuring essentially does, as you can see here, on figure 3C, what that does is essentially manipulate things within its own context. So we restructure a database that's, re that's in here. We restructure the relational tables to make a database. That's over here. So it's in the concept. We're not trying to interpret. We are just essentially uh, restructuring. We're in the context of where we are. And finally, the concept of re-engineering, which is different than reverse engineering. What we're trying to do in re-engineering is redeploy that particular data perhaps or process into a different platform or different uh, venue. So we're going from mainframes to servers to mobile, those types of things is, is what is going on uh, in, in this particular area as, as we see it, okay? So what we get into right now is this concept of what we refer to as reverse data engineering. And in order to get into reverse data engineering, we have to essentially look at it uh, from this particular standpoint. And reverse data engineering is actually what we suggest we're trying to do with big data. Get the understanding of the data from a running database so that we can reuse it in a different format. So what I'm trying to do here in our presentations there is put a little method to the madness that possibly is out there. How do you actually do this? And 
what is the 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 qualif qualifiers that are required you know as we essentially do this so reverse data engineering assumes that all des data design intent has been carried forward into construction so we actually have taken the business understanding the semantics not just the syntax the semantics and brought it down into construction and it's simply somehow encrypted when I mean encrypted not confidential but it's somehow in the structure um, you know as we see it in practice we find that the transition from analysis to design from design to construction loses certain details that's what we have to essentially understand that's there and as we move forward into this we find out that our data models going to databases we lose some semantics we lose behavior rules we lose some of that structure because if we the only thing we have is running data and the relationships between data we've lost some of those things that are there and then when if we translate our database designs into relational structures we lose design intent such as the reasons for making design choices what was the reason we did this why did we use an index data integrity implementation doesn't show us that so essentially if we attempt to reverse engineer from a system whose documentation is lost or seriously out of date from years of maintenance we will become aware of business requirements and design intent that can only be recovered by human insight and retained knowledge this is what we need to understand I'm not saying don't do big data but recognize that a lot of the reasoning for the data being there has been lost this is the most significant translation loss is the loss of meaning not loss of structure so let me say it more directly let me say it more directly which definition of airport do we actually have now what we're going to do is show you an example of what this is to get you thinking about why plan analyze design construct will be able to address big data so if we look at this particular diagram it shows an example of a data model that is for uh, order for fulfillment it doesn't really matter what this is and if some of this terminology and and symbology is is a bit um, off to some of you I want to just explain it to you a little bit because this model here is really what provides us with an understanding of what uh, the the information is the data is that we have and the question is how does that actually transform itself into a run database this data model essentially describes uh, the customers as we can see here uh, it describes the orders it describes the geographic locations and one of the things that we can see here essentially is that each customer is located um, in at least one location and could have multiple locations across multiple states so each customer is located at each one location and possibly multiple locations and this is of course the symbol for one to many I don't want to go through all the data modeling techniques here for for you right now but basically this model provides us with lots and lots and lots of information that comes from the understanding the semantic understanding this is what the the business people told us a customer can be located in one or many locations and that's a very important thing to be able uh, you know to uh, to understand you know as we see it and of course a complete data model I'm not going to go through the other symbologies here will normally have a definition for each name component what is a customer what is an airport which definition of airport do we have okay just think about trying to take all these things together all you see here is AARPORT we don't know exactly which one it is because that's what we're trying to do is to bring all the stuff together because we were told that that's the usage and it is different and essentially all the behavior rules that are there so what we have essentially at this particular point is an ability to actually make some sense out of what is going on let's go a little bit further right now okay let's take these requirements again plan analyze design construct and now move it down its life cycle now business requirements 
uh, are captured by the data model and normally translated into essentially a database design, which sort of sounds pretty good. Once again, throwing a bit of terminology at you right now, um, what we have here is essentially a normalized relational design for those data requirements. And again, uh, my apologies if this symbology uh, is, is a bit uh, confusing to some of you. Uh, we really need to show this to you so you see what to watch out for that's there. And essentially what we have here is now the transformation of the semantic understanding into a relational structure. So for example, IED0, excuse me, IEDORD01, uh, okay, is the order entity type. So we've transferred the concept of order, O-R-D-E-R, into a relational structure, and here's all of its attributes that are there. And for them, some of you that are comfortable with this, the key elements, the foreign keys that we need essentially to move forward. And so what we've taken is that semantically rich model and translated it, transformed it into a relational structure that is there. So far, we have a little less understanding, but I'm sure for some of you, it's raising some eyebrows at this particular point when we see this. At this point, we've simply taken the data model, as it says here, and produced an uncompromised relational design equivalent. Yet we've already lost some meeting. Now let's look at what happens if we were to reverse engineer from these relational tables. As you can see here, all of a sudden, already from that relational structure, we have some unfortunate question marks because we've lost that in the table. Okay, we find that if we come back to our customer activity, we have lost the mandatory in precisely one record under customer. Hmm. And as you can see here, all these question marks, once again, without going through all these details for us here right now through our webinar, are question marks that we've lost, not because we're bad designers, but because the modeling of the requirements, the semantics, is naturally lost as we move forward in the data structures. We need something else. It exists possibly in the programs, but not in the data structures, hint, hint, hint. Or it exists in the documentation or in people's heads, but it doesn't exist in the data model alone. Let's go a little bit further. Let's go into essentially now moving forward into a year after this has been built. Tuning and maintenance. There's three things that we see here. We've lost the business rules. Relational tables alone cannot express certain constraints. If we're to reverse engineer these tables, we would end up with semantic loss of certain types of business rules. It doesn't exist in the data alone. It's not an argument against relational tables. We're simply dem demonstrating that we truly lose important details as we pr proceed down the life cycle. This is something that we have to recognize. In the olden days, we used to be called data processing. Now we're called IT but we still process data. Without that context, we're going to have a problem. Our loss worsens as the components are subject to maintenance. Now I'm going to show you some of this in the next model that's here. Okay. After tuning and maintenance, we get something that looks like this. Wow. Now the wow should be for a couple of different reasons. This is essentially a tuned and maintenance, uh, maintained data structure that's there. Because of this loss that occurs as we proceeded down the life cycle, as you can see here, reverse engineering cannot completely reconstruct the database design, the data, excuse me, the data 
design intent, not the database design, the data design intent, or the business data requirements. So the question for us is at this particular point, how do we get from this understanding, which is really where we are when it comes to big data, where we have running data structures, to this understanding? And what's more important is what happens if we try to take the data and make inferences out of it. And so what I'm leaving you with is that big data is dependent upon architecture, plan, analyze, design, construct. If we don't have this, we essentially have a hum right now. So what we're suggesting is that quality data must precede any big data activities. How do you get quality data? Through enterprise architecture, through essentially an architected approach. Most systems in associated database have not been forward engineered from what we can tell. We don't know everybody and we don't know all of you online and we haven't had the privilege of working with everybody. But most of the things haven't been forward engineers with full traceability from the business understanding. Most organizations have no metadata understanding, assuring that data is in one database, for example, the term customer or the term airport or the term train has the exact same meaning in the structure in another database. Consolidating data using any new technology will not address these issues. It's not about mushing things together. It's about understanding things. Oh, by the way, mushing is a technical term, as I think I mentioned. It's not a technology issue. So we want to be a little bit careful as we essentially move forward. So how do we actually do this? How do we actually address this? So what we need to do is to figure out, as you can see here on these blue arrows, is how do you get from a running structure to something different? And we're going to suggest to you the way that we do that is through enterprise architecture. Basically, a top-down architected approach, and the top-down approach is not decomposition, but the transformations from the business intent into the, relational, uh, the, into the relationship understanding to a technology neutral, to a technology specific, to a solution specific, with all that traceability and forward engineering, then we can reverse engineer and we will have essentially a successful big data activity. Without this, all I can suggest to you is that it's a bit of, it's a, bit of a crap shoot. We don't know. I've given you some examples uh, of areas that you can see, I think, quite clearly. At American Airlines, for example, how difficult it would be so in your own organization, when you're attempting to do big data without a forward engineering or the phrase is essentially enterprise architected approach, we need to be very careful and look at not only the name, not only the name, but its context and then see if we can make heads or tails out of that. Some of you, I believe, will have some success in this area, but I think we'll have a tremendous amount of success if we have an enterprise architected approach. So you can see how with an architected approach, we can go from the business intent to the relation, business relationship understanding to the technology neutral representation, to the technology specific representation, to the solution specific representation, to the implementation. Once we have that, then on this chart, we can go back again and we will have a successful big data activity. I hope that our brief time together has given you some insight into this concept and these, these, uh, these activities that are so popular right now. And uh, of course, in an hour session, we can't cover every conceivable nuance uh, that's there. We've only lightly touched on this, but hopefully this presentation gives you enough to have your organization think about this as you go forward. Obviously, we would suggest enterprise architecture 
needs to come prior to any big data initiatives. I thank you for your uh, participation, uh, your, uh, uh, your listening uh, today. Uh, it's an interesting week for all of us as we move into the holiday period. I want to leave all of you with uh, a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever holiday you're, you're uh, celebrating, or if you're just taking a little bit of time off, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy yourself. I hope this added to your uh, in, uh, insight into these particular topics. We will be asking you if we can, if we can in, uh, indulge you. Uh, we're going to be sending you a bit of a survey to ask you how you enjoyed this, if you found it useful, and if there's any other topics that you would uh, be interested in. Uh, the session has been recorded, uh, and if anyone is interested in seeing that information, we'll be more than happy to get that to you. From our Enterprise Architecture Center of Excellence and our Business Architecture Center of Excellence, once again, thank you very, very much for your time, and uh, perhaps we'll be able to work with you in the future. My best to you, my best to all. Thank you again.